Now, will you turn in your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 10. You know, if there's one thing the devil hates besides speaking in tongues, it's the truth of divine healing. Now, that's why we stress both of them so much, is until a person can function effectively physically, he's largely handicapped spiritually. You know that to be true. You don't even feel like telling anybody about Jesus when you're sick. And it isn't God's intention that we should be sick. Well, we read, after these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two by two before, the fa- <clears throat> before his face into every city and place, whither he himself would come. Therefore said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. (laughs) You're not surprised, are you? (laughs) Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way, and into whatsoever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house, that is, asking for donations. And into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Then I call your attention to verse 9. Heal the sick that are therein and say. He didn't say just heal the sick, but he said, and say unto them, this is the evidence that the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Healing is evidence of the presence of the kingdom. That's just how important it is. And... Divine healing is mentioned more in Scripture than any other gift outside prophecy. There are thousands of cases of authenticated healing. I mean divine, supernatural healing. But even more importantly, if Christ has suffered that pain for me, and I reject his atoning work when I hurt and don't call upon him, and try to alleviate my suffering by remedies that men have invented, then Christ suffered and died in vain for me. He suffered in vain for me. And I don't want that on my conscious conscience or upon my record either when I face him. Uh, I, had four, I have 14 years that are under the blood of <laughs> unbelief. <clears throat> Praise God, I won't have to face those. But I lost a lot of blessings in those 14 years as a Christian. I heard a lot and I was cut up a lot and all of that. But thank God I repented of it when I got the baptism. And from this point on, I haven't spent a dime on medicine in almost eight years. No one in our house has. We've never darkened the door of a doctor, doctor's office. The only time we've been in a hospital is to visit others. Praise God. Praise God. Now, I suppose the most popular misconception about divine healing concerns the idea or is with regard to the idea that the way God heals today is through medical science. This is this is his method today. And there's a a shred of evidence in the scripture for this. Now, you recall that we're setting forth the truth that God is restoring the ministry to the body and the gifts of revelation and demonstration and communication, and we're dealing with some demonstration this morning, how God wants to demonstrate his love by laying hands on the sick that they might recover. I've heard so many people and read so many arguments to the effect that that uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is the only chapter in 1 Corinthians, of any importance at least. And it's strange that a sandwich right between 12 and 14 that speak of the gifts. And Paul never says that, <clears throat> that you're to love a person and not help him if you can. He says if you help him without love, it profits you nothing. He didn't, he didn't say it didn't profit the other fellow anything. 
If I pray for you and you're healed and uh, I didn't minister that in love, you still got healed. But it didn't profit me anything. Or Roberts tells one time of a man stopping him after praying for people for three or four hours in meeting uh, with thousands in attendance. And he was tired and on his way to his room and somebody just rushed up in the hall in the hotel and just grabbed him and whirled him around and said, pray for me. I mean, demanded it. <clears throat> Well, he said, I just slapped my hand on his head and prayed for him be healed in Jesus' name. And he was healed. A miracle. But he said, he said, it really offended me. And he said, he got healed, but I didn't get a bit of blessing out of it. He said, I couldn't sleep all night <clears throat> because of the way I administered the gift of healing. So the gifts operate without love, friends. Yes, they do. At least, at least the, hypothetically, they... Theoretically, they can and do. They won't, of course, forever operate that way. So Paul doesn't separate love from the gifts or the gifts from love. You see, for me to say I love you when you hurt, and God has said in the body, gifts of healing are <clears throat> the prayer of faith is sick and I don't pray for you. Uh, how am I demonstrating my love to you? It's just words. He says love not in word, but in deed and in truth. And so... The popular misconception then that that God has uh, is now manifesting healing through medical science and nurses and drugs and uh, the medical drugs and medical missions and so forth. Uh, we're told that uh, in in Christ's day, for example, in Paul's day, they didn't have all of these wonderful techniques and treatments and the drugs and medicines that have been discovered today, that after all, God inspires the discovery of these drugs and he gives the skills to the physicians and the surgeons and so forth. And therefore, we ought to make use of the means that he's made available. They didn't have these means available in Paul, uh, Jesus' day, or let's say the first century church or the early church. Uh, but I think we can see there's a decided difference between a surgeon who spends 20 years developing his skills and is able to remove a kidney from your body so that you don't lose your life uh, than in divine healing where one is prayed for and a kidney that's diseased is restored instantly. Uh, one is healing by mutilation. The other is healing by restoration. I think there's a difference. <clears throat> And that's not being derogatory toward medical science because uh, for those who need that, why we don't want to see them hurt, as I always say. We're talking to believers. We're talking to Christians. We're talking to people who have an inheritance. I don't go out there in the street and preach divine healing. You preach Jesus out in the street and then divine healing naturally follows. But <clears throat> uh, a, a medical student, his first week in medical college can cut your kidney out. You don't want him to. Why? Because you say, well, he doesn't have the ability. Well, if it's a gift, why doesn't he? <laughs> if it's a gift of God, if that's the way divine healing is operating today, then why doesn't he? Why don't you let him cut you open at, at a week or two after the introduction to medical school? Why well, you say, uh, how foolish. That's my point. One is a skill developed by experience and training and study. And one is a divine enabling. 1 Corinthians 12 says a supernatural gift of the spirit and so it's like playing a piano you see there's a difference between a person who spent 10 or 20 30 years <clears throat> developing their skills uh, at the piano uh, that has come through development and training a difference between that and one or two I've heard of that just asked the Lord to enable them to play and they didn't know a note on the piano and sat down and began to play in a matter of days or weeks or months played beautifully all by ear it's happened. I mean, cases, uh, I've even had, uh, uh, I don't recall who it is now, someone told me this happened to them. They don't know a word of music. Played beautifully. <clears throat> well, now, certainly, to some extent, <clears throat> in some cases at least, uh, these natural endowments that you can develop are God-given. Uh, one is a natural endowment. As I've said, I'd make a good psychologist. That's... That's just the way it is. Some people have that natural insight to know why people act the way they do and say the things they do. And they know how to put two and two together. It enables me to pray for people, to intercede for them, even before they ever say anything's wrong, because I'm already seeing things. And uh, I've had people come and confess things that I already knew. But that isn't word of knowledge. You see, one is supernatural. 
And while God can give natural endowments, we're not talking about those. And to say that we ought to make use of the means that God has made available, because, you see, uh, people will say, well, I believe in miracles, but after all, God gives all the skills and inspires all these discoveries. And generally, he heals through these methods, so occasionally he can work a miracle. But I would reply to that that there's a distinct difference in the Bible, if you turn over to Mark chapter 5, between medical healing and divine healing. And we're never in this church, and I never in my ministry talk about medical healing. I'm talking about divine healing. And what charismatics and full gospel circles are teaching today, 95% of the time, is a watered-down version of uh, of divine healing. Or a pepped up version of what I used to believe as a (laughs) denominational pastor. Um, Mark chapter 5, verse 25. A certain woman which had an issue of blood, 12 years. And I want to show you there's a distinction between medical healing and divine healing in the Bible. She had an issue of blood, 12 years. She had suffered many things of many physicians. Well, now... Let me just interrupt to say that if you'll trace out all the teachings about medical healing and physicians in the scripture, you'll find the scriptures invariably give a negative report or have a negative attitude toward it. Now, that's just one of the truths of scripture, contrary to what is popularly taught today in our churches. This is the way God heals. Now, that's no criticism of physicians. That's a criticism of the Bible of believers who resort to the arm of the flesh rather than God. And so here's the picture again. Why did he put this in here? Most people writing today wouldn't. They'd leave this out. They wouldn't say that she had suffered many things by many physicians. They'd said, well, she just didn't get healed that way. But God tells it like it is. She hurt and she had suffered and she had spent all that she had. And I think a lot of you know something about that. And she was nothing better, but she rather grew worse. Sounds like Uzziah in the Old Testament. He died because he went to the physicians and sought not the Lord. That's exactly what the scriptures say. The scriptures always depict that negative approach to medicine. Well, when she heard of Jesus, she came in the crowd behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power or virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? Hallelujah. Now that's pretty divine healing. She didn't even touch him. He didn't touch her. All she did was touch the hem of his garment. And I think it's in Matthew 13, the last verse that speaks of... Uh, many were healed just by touching his garments. Now what healed them? Not his garment, but faith. Divine healing operates by faith. And so there is right here in this passage a clear distinction made between divine healing and medical healing. Medical healing, medical missions, nursing, drugs can have a place for people without faith, but they should never be thought of, as the church does today, as a substitute for divine healing. These are not substitutes for divine healing. You see, in this passage in Mark 5, one is natural healing, which you didn't get, by the way, and one is supernatural. Uh, One sometimes works for some people with some ailments. The other always works for all people who have faith. And in one, God gets the glory, and in the other, who gets the glory? Now, come on, who gets the glory? Have you ever been in a hospital and seen them running up and down the halls praising the Lord for their healing? I've never seen it. I've not even seen Christians in the room praising God for their healing. I have to put the words in their mouth, and they'll change the subject. Even when, you know, they got a healing by a remedy or surgery or something. You watch them change the subject. You say, well, praise the Lord for the healing. They'll change the subject. Invariably. If you know of an exception, then I'll praise the Lord with you for it. <laughs> so medical science and hospitals, while they have a place for the, to alleviate the suffering of this unbelieving world and alleviate the suffering of unbelieving Christians who've never been taught the, the uh, scope of their inheritance, it has no place for the Christian. God says, I have a much better way. I am the Lord. 
that healeth thee. That I forgive all of your iniquities and I heal all of your diseases. The argument that we ought to make use of the means that God has made available, since he's made the drugs and the skills of the doctors and so forth available to us, we ought to make use of these means, uh, uh, is uh, contrary to Scripture. There's no word in Scripture that says we're to make use of any other means except uh, to apply to God by faith and prayer for healing. This is the Scripture picture. And to say that we ought to make use of the means that God has made available is exactly what those of us who believe in divine healing insist upon. Now, what means has he made available? What does he tell us in James 5, for example? Is there any sick among you? Let them call for the doctors. (laughs) Isn't that what he says over in James 5? No? Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Now, where did you find, where do you find the verse, let him call the doctors? You won't find it in the Bible, friends. And to say that they didn't have doctors then, friends, is to ignore the fact that Luke, the beloved physician, wrote the Gospel of Luke and the whole book of Acts, and never, ever once mentions medicine as a means of healing. It's always supernatural healing when he reports it. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint him with oil. In the name of the Lord, <clears throat> the prayer of faith will heal the sick. And the promise is the Lord will raise him up. Now, where's your proof text? There's, there's the scriptural proof text. Why is it, dear friends, that some of you still are listening to the vain reasonings of your mind and to the devil's suggestions and the old theology that you've been taught And you're still relying on the way of the world for healing. The church says we ought to follow the way that God has made available in this dispensation. I agree. If we want to follow God's way, then here it is. All through scripture. To say if if there's a drug or a treatment that can affect a cure and we ought to make use of that is to ignore, as I've said, what the scriptures show. Here is Luke, the beloved physician who writes... The Gospel of Luke, 24 chapters. The book of Acts, 28 chapters. And you'll search in vain for one mention of medicine as a means of cure. Why didn't he do as Pentecostals and full gospel Christians, uh, charismatic Christians do today, and pay their money to support medical missions uh, on the field? I, I get letters practically every day wanting money for me to support medic, medical missions, and some of them are charismatics. And, and in, uh, in some cases, I've even preached divine healing in their services where they're sending them to the mail to support some of their medical missions. I don't find a word of this in Scripture. The Scriptures say you go forth and preach the gospel and the signs confirming the word and one of them is healing will follow. Not go establish uh, a medical mission over there and, and treat people with the remedies of the world as the world treats people. Uh, you just don't find this in Scripture. And it's just, uh, it's a, just a little uh, uh, unsettling to me to find that Christians seem to make no distinctions in their minds or do not see the contradiction in pouring money into medical missions. And their large Bible school in Dallas, Texas, who wanted me to come and speak, had their medical missions and made a big thing of it. And one of the reasons I didn't go, want me to come and teach for a week. One reason I didn't go is because I knew they wouldn't receive this message. The Lord showed me they wouldn't. And they wouldn't. <clears throat> and I don't want to get into that, but they just couldn't handle the faith message. And healing, of course, is a part of the faith message. But there's no basis in Scripture. The, uh, like in Acts 28, Paul reports, uh, Luke reports the healing of Publius. Now Luke was there reporting it, and he doesn't say a word about, now we tried all that we had in our bag and nothing worked. <laughs> and so as a last resort, we prayed for him. You know what? God performed a miracle in healing. Healed him. No, he doesn't report it that way. Now, we're sorry if you're here for the first time. You've never heard anything about divine healing. Divine healing is God. Amen. I don't, it doesn't matter whether it's a broken bone or you're gasping your last breath from tuberculosis. Divine healing is God. We're not even talking about whether some people get healed and whether some do not. We're talking about divine healing. The question of how they get healed and... Why sometimes they don't get healed is another subject. 
But divine healing, don't, don't muddy the waters by, by calling it something that it isn't. There are many things doctors cannot help. We're talking about divine healing. So Luke talks about divine healing all through, uh, all through the book of Acts. That ought to quicken your faith. You ought to get into the book of Acts and the gospel of Luke and see what the physician says. I was in a meeting several years ago and I was about half through my testimony on faith when an epileptic spirit seized uh, uh, one of the uh, men in the singing group. There were three or four there that had uh, sung to us. Of course, we didn't know he had epilepsy. They told us later that that they were almost afraid to go out because he had seizures that frequently. And <clears throat> the president of the chapter is a medical doctor, charismatic. And when that spirit seized him and threw him into the seizure and uh, he blanked out and all of that, he sat there. This is a charismatic meeting. He sat there. Praise God, he didn't budge. What can medical science do about a person in an epileptic seizure? Nothing. Nothing. And what, any, what he could have done, they'd already done. They stuck a book of matches, closed, of course, in his mouth to keep him from biting his tongue in half. They did what they could do. Medical science had nothing to offer. And praise God, he realized that because he happens to be a doctor that prays for seriously ill patients they're letting. And so we who were talking faith and who believed went over and cast the spirit out. He sat up. And came up and made a confession of faith, said, I felt the Spirit go. I just left and uh, was filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in new tongues. <laughs> Divine healing we're talking about. <clears throat> Praise God for doctors who are charismatic, and there are a lot of them. They're in the minority, like 1% at the most, I would say. Probably less than that. Maybe a one-tenth of 1% that are charismatic. And many of them, not all, because not all have been taught, believe in divine healing. I wish I would just had the time this morning to, to tell you personal experiences from surgeons and dentists and uh, medical doctors uh, who go far beyond what the average Christian will do in the pew. It's total trust in God. Amen. And they don't, they don't just uh, settle for divine healing. <clears throat> Some of them are going for divine health. That's their confession. But anyway, to use drugs and things of this nature is a poor substitute at best because many of the drugs have, uh, have side effects, have uh, unwanted side effects. And there isn't a doctor in the world who knows all of the possible adverse side effects of any of the drugs that he gives you. In fact, they always have adverse side effects. Aspirins cause bleeding, not sometimes, all the time in your stomach and in your intestinal tract. Just common aspirin is one of the worst things you can take. People have died from taking aspirin. And penicillin, of course, kills as well as heals. That's common medical knowledge. And this wonderful drug, thalidomide, which does enable a pregnant woman to get to sleep if she has insomnia, also causes babies, if they take it within the 13, first 13 weeks of conception, causes babies to be born with flippers for arms and legs. Wonderful thing to get you to sleep, but don't take it if you're pregnant. There's a lot of skepticism today about divine healing, but it isn't going to change the fact that it's clearly taught in Scripture from Exodus 15:26 to 1 Peter 2:24. In fact, it's all in between there, friends. But there's a lot of skepticism that, that tries to say that what we're talking about is uh, when they get healed, just mental suggestion and psychology, and it's uh, akin to Christian science and that sort of thing. Well, we've told you time and time again in this church that 75% of all illness is psychosomatic anyway. Which means that, <clears throat> that organic functional disorders can result from mental states like hate, resentment, greed, jealousy, uh, lust, uh, worry, fear, anxiety. It can affect your body. Christians get peptic ulcers just like non-Christians for the same reasons. Worry and hurry. Hurry is just the outward evidence of inward worry. Anyway, you can get sick just like a non-Christian because the same things cause it. And so psychiatrists and Christian science have capitalized on what is a medical truth. I mean, if things true, it's true. I don't care if Plato said it, it's true. I mean, it doesn't matter who said it. If it's true, it's true. I mean, even an unbeliever can make two and two equal four, you see. If he says two and two is four, it's a fact. And so they've capitalized on the fact, Christian scientists, psychologists, psychiatrists, and so forth, on the fact that man 
can make himself sick and much sickness stems from the spiritual aspect. So I said last Sunday night we're healed on two levels when we get healed. Not just the body, you get healed in the spirit first. That's what we mean by faith. You can see the inner man, the mind, the spirit believes. And that believing is a healing of the spirit. As soon as you believe, the spirit isn't sick, but as soon as you believe that which controls the bodily functions, which is the spirit, it ministers. That is, allows the healing power of God to flow to the body. It's all so simple when we see it. God said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And simply because a Christian science, scientist tells a person with ulcers, quit worrying, quit worrying, it's all in your head, and he quits worrying, and it is all in his head, and he, his ulcers are healed, doesn't change the fact uh, that, it, that when we pray for a person the same way, that they'll be healed supernaturally, or if they do not give up their worry, the healing, or the disease rather, will come right back. Because it is psychosomatic. And so, uh, because a psychiatrist knows through counseling he can help some people get healed physically, isn't going to change the fact uh, that, uh, that divine healing is still uh, the method by which God has ordained that we should apply for healing. And besides that, many, many things can't be healed uh, through just suggestion. That is, you giving up your worries and your anxieties and your resentments and your anger and your greed and whatever is causing this condition. There's some things that psychiatry and... Uh, well, that you can't charge to psychosomatic illness. We had a psychiatrist, rather a psychologist, <clears throat> uh, ask our church to pray for one of his Mennonite patients several years ago. And so the church agreed together <clears throat> that she was delivered of those spirits. He said she had demons. And it wasn't but a matter of a week or two until he wrote the church and said that a miracle had taken place, said by her next visit, he said everything had changed he could communicate with her, and she, she was a different person entirely. He says, now I'm helping her. I'm helping her with her problems because she's delivered of that spirit. Well, you see, everything isn't psychosomatic. Uh, everything isn't a simple matter. Some things are incurable, like cancer and polio and heart disease and tuberculosis. That is advanced tuberculosis, blindness and deafness. Uh, so it's going to take a supernatural act of God to heal these things. Because uh, medical science cannot do a thing for people like this that I've just mentioned. Many things I haven't mentioned. And so <clears throat> medical science is not divine healing. Medical healing is medical healing. It's not divine healing. And sometimes you can get healed, but a lot of times you don't. God's never lost a patient yet. <laughs> but a lot of times they lose patients. And they try all sorts of remedies, and God has but one. And that's your faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, medical science can help people who have no better way, but at best it's a poor substitute for faith. That's why we want to get faith in people. And if you turn over to 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 9, I want to show you this is um, a supernatural thing he's talking about, and not a natural thing at all. <clears throat> But the manifestation of the Spirit, verse 7, is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit. Note it's called a manifestation of the Spirit. One is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Another the word of knowledge by the Spirit. To another faith by the Spirit. To another gifts of healing. How? Training. Skills. Experience. By the Spirit. Why, why do we say that... Uh, Visions are by the Spirit, and healing isn't by the Spirit. So, <clears throat> the gift he's talking about here is supernatural. And at best, anything else as a substitute is a poor one. Cataracts can be removed by painful surgery and much expense, but they're not always successful when they operate. We've seen God in our meetings literally in a matter of seconds sometimes, minutes and sometimes hours, dissolve cataracts just by the prayer of faith. We prayed for people that as soon as they opened their eyes, they, one woman began to shout while well, she said, I can already see the third row and she could hardly see a thing. And as she started back through the aisle, she said, the colors are coming back. And another woman in her 80s, uh, within a half an hour, had half her vision back and got the rest of it in the car in Florida recently. 
came back the next day and gave her testimony. She said the cataracts completely dissolved by the time she got home. Uh, well, praise God when people don't have faith and they can slice that off of that eyeball. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God, there's a better way <clears throat> for us. And I know what kidney stone operations are, friends. Literally, they cut you half in two. I've always said, thank God it wasn't both kidneys that they operate on at the same time, or you'd be in two pieces. That's how bad an incision. I've got it to prove it. Yeah, three weeks of pain. I can't take pain medicine. Thank God I got the baptism and discovered divine healing. I had to lie there. I've been under surgery five times, and I would have to lie there with no pain medicine. I was worse off with it. You don't know what torment I used to go through. I just And you'd have to fight the doctors and nurses to keep them filling you full of drugs and put you to sleep. Oh, I had went to sleep for the surgery, yeah. <laughs> I'm not that brave, but... Uh, <clears throat> Oh, but you have no idea. I've never, uh, you don't know what sickness is until you, you can get sick from pain medicine. So I had to lie there and suffer that agony and torment. And I know what that is. And three weeks of it and over a thousand dollars. But praise God, faith can dissolve those stones. <laughs> Happens all the time. See, I know the other way. You can have that way if you want it. If Jesus bore that pain for me and those kidney stones and that heart disease at Calvary and all the other things that the devil lays on you, why should I bear them? If I insist on it, then Jesus can't. And it works the same way for your sins. If you want to bear yours, he can't be your sin bearer. And so medical science can help. They've invented eyeglasses, crutches, wheelchairs, hearing aids, but God can remove the cause for needing those things is what we're saying. That there is, uh, there is a place for divine healing. And some things, of course, as I've said, are incurable and nothing can help. Beyond help. <coughs> Medical healing has a place to alleviate suffering for people who don't have faith. But God, like everything else, expects us to go deeper with him in his word and believe that what he's provided, he must have had a reason and purpose. And that when we call on him, the greatest pleasure of his heart is when we call on him to meet our needs. As he told one brother, he said, the reason that most of my children are in poverty and owe everybody in town is because they will not believe my word. He said, I would bless them financially if they would believe me. They've been taught all of this unbelief about financial prosperity. That God is somehow angry if we get out of debt. And his feelings are hurt if we feel good. That he's only happy when we're sad and beat and sick and poverty stricken. You know, just common logic. <laughs> I have to laugh at all those years that I denied myself the fullness of my inheritance. You just have to laugh at yourself. I'm not laughing at you. I'm not criticizing you. I've got 14 years of testimony, friends. You don't want to hear it. <laughs> the results were rather disappointing well praise God you've got 14 years or 4 years some of you got 20 or 30 so uh, never get offended when we tell you the way it is just say well praise God at least my eyes are open now and I want to go further with the Lord Amen. medical healing is not divine healing I'll give you another reason the, the, the medical healing are not the supernatural gifts of healing operating because most doctors are not even Christian. And if, if the gifts of medical science are the gifts of healing, then we've got the contradiction of God operating the supernatural gifts through unbelievers who don't even believe in him. And many of them uh, curse him and have no use for God at all. Agnostic, atheistic. Most doctors are non-Christian friends. Does the Bible say that the gifts of healing work through unbelievers? No. These signs will follow them that believe. In my name they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. How can it be any plainer? 1 Corinthians 12 doesn't say the gifts work through unbelievers. He's writing here to Christians. Now, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. He's talking to the brethren. He said the gifts of healing have been set in the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 and following. In the church, not in the world. Oh, yes, all healing is somehow going to be traced back to God because medicine wouldn't even cure you without divine grace. But certainly we don't have to say that, that anything good that happens would be from God. 
If he didn't give you the breath to breathe, you would collapse. If he didn't speak the word of faith, this whole universe would disappear. Colossians 1 says he perpetually upholds this by the word of his mouth. Jesus does. He speaks that word of faith. He just says, be, and it is. And he believes that. He doesn't have to keep repeating that prayer. But it is a, it is a constant believing that this, this world will exist. It says all things hold together by the word of his power. It says all things hold together by the word of his power. Amen. It isn't just here, friends. And we don't just exist. It's because of divine grace. And so, yes, if a person gets healed in the hospital, or if they go to the hospital, don't criticize them. Pray for them. I do. I don't criticize them. I'll go visit Christians in the hospital who ought to know better. I'm not going to criticize them. I'll pray for them if they'll let me. I'll pray for their healing if they'll let me. But I'm also, when they come here, going to tell them they're wrong for doing it and that God has something better for them. He loves them and he doesn't want to see them have to go through that. He wants them to get built up in the faith. Well, there are many kinds of healing besides the gift. The gift, of course, here in verse uh, uh, 10 is in the plural, as you notice. Or verse 9, in the plural, to another, the gifts of healings. Literally, the Greek says gifts of healings. Why in the plural? Because there are many, many kinds of sicknesses and diseases and there are many, many kinds of gifts of healings. There's not one gift that heals everything and not one minister has all the gifts. Uh, The time will come when I think that will be changed. There's been one man that we know of that had all the gifts of healing operating in his ministry, William Branham. There He prayed for hundreds of thousands of people. I didn't say thousands. I said hundreds of thousands. There's never a known case that didn't get healed when he prayed for them. Never missed it. Gordon Lindsay, who was his crusade director for years, said that he sat on the platform and he never once ever missed it. Now, of course, a lot of things you couldn't see happening because they were inward. But many you could. But the point is, there's never a case where, where that he ever missed. He had all the gifts. Of healing, But generally that isn't going to be the way it is. And you will largely see in a ministry, it works this way in mine, that certain things get healed instantly. When we say, uh, well, a better word would be immediately, uh, moments, hours, or a few days. You can have the gifts of healings and it, and it takes weeks or months for a thing to be fully manifested. Read Oral Roberts' magazine, Abundant Life. Many of those testimonies were gradual healings over the months being manifested because of the nature of it. It might have been uh, muscular dystrophy or uh, some congenital illness uh, that God just caused supernaturally, of course, caused the system to throw it off and the muscles to be created and bone and whatever it is to be formed uh, by natural supernatural processes and all that. But when the gifts are operating, the healing will come. Generally, it isn't going to be that long of a delay, of course. And these are not gifts that we have or the person who has the gift operating in his life or ministry. It's not gifts they have that they just pray for people when they want and that gift starts operating. That gift only operates when the Lord turns it on. And the way that you know it is, invariably, is the anointing is in the hands. It's invariably that way. And... uh, uh, It's not a gift that a person has. It's a gift for the person who needs the healing. I've heard William Branham say uh, that uh, when God gave him these gifts, he said to him, he said, these are gifts of healings to take to those who are sick. See, they're not something you possess. Word of knowledge isn't something you possess. It's given you for some purpose, you see. But there are many ways in which to heal. I want to give you uh, those this morning to make uh, this uh, message complete that we don't think, well, because I don't have the gifts of healing, I can't pray for the sick. But if you turn over to Mark chapter 6, I want to show you three or four or five ways in which you can enter into this ministry of healing whether or not you have the gifts operating in your life. Not everyone, Paul says, will have the gifts of healing. Mark chapter 6. He does say, however, that every one of us will have a manifestation of the Spirit. 
Tongues, interpretation, prophecy, word of knowledge, wisdom, gifts of healing, discerning of spirits. Not all will have gifts of healing, but all can pray for the sick. <clears throat> Mark 6, um, verse, well, I was going to start reading verse 7. They called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power over unclean spirits. And so, verse 12, they went out and preached that men should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Now, here is one method. See, sending out the, the apostles, and <clears throat> here we're see, seeing that they anoint with oil and pray for the sick. Some people ask me, is there a place in the Bible where we're supposed to anoint people with oil except... James 5, where they are supposed to call us, you know, for the elders of the church to come. I said, yes, like in Mark 6 here, that they went forth. They didn't always do it this way, but sometimes they anointed with oil and asked to pray for them. But this is one way. So you can anoint people with oil if that's what they want. Now, the oil doesn't heal. <clears throat> of course, it's, uh, it symbolizes the healing and anointing of the Holy Spirit to heal. Then over in James 5, we read... <clears throat> About, uh, well, we've already referred to this. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Prayer of faith will heal the sick. And so this is the anointing with oil in the prayer of faith. Here's a way. This isn't the gift of healing operating here at all. But you can pray for your wife or your husband or your children. Anoint them and pray for them. It's good to anoint them. Uh, that, that's just one way, though. But it will work. And any believer can use this. We have some friends up east. When we're up there speaking, we generally stay in their house. And she's the one, by the way, I mentioned last week that learned how to confess a good confession about healing. I told you how that she was talking to one of our her tenants in a trailer uh, that pulled into the park that they operate, trailer uh, parking arrangement up there on a farm. And... Uh, the woman said, I have cystitis, and she said, oh, that's bad, I used to have it, and you have to watch yourself, it can come back on you, and she said, she knew she made a mistake, as soon as she said that, in a matter of hours, she was bed fast, stayed there, she said, I stayed there two weeks. Well, the rest of the story is, she stayed there, and she said, and her husband was sitting there, and he's a retired engineer, and you'd have to hear them tell him to really get the, uh, get the uh, joy out of it, because they, they really, when they got the baptism, they sat on the edge of the bed and cast demons out of each other. And they went out, too. They didn't know anybody to believe it. And this fellow who's up in his 70s, he said for, for about three weeks, he had to get up every night and go wretch. Demons kept coming out of him at night in his sleep. Well, I'm not going to teach on demons. You don't understand about that. Uh, uh, just lay it aside until you can hear some tapes or read some literature on it. But anyway, they said, she said, I lay there for two weeks, and he'd come in and talk to me and, you know, and get me a drink and... All that business, but he never offered to pray for me. And she said, after two weeks, she said, I just got to the point where I just couldn't stand any longer lying there in that bed. And she said, all right, all right, I forgive everybody I've sinned against. She started confessing your sins. That's what James 5 goes on to say. She went through all the conditions here, and she said, now pray for me. Well, he said, I was waiting for you to ask me. <laughs> now, why? Because he knew what James 5, 14 said. Is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of church. He said, he just laughed. He said, I knew it wouldn't be faith until she asked me. He said, I could have run in there and prayed for any time. But he said, that wouldn't have been her faith. Well, I hope you can handle that. He wasn't being, he wasn't being mean to her. And she got healed. I mean, just like that. Of cystitis. Was out of bed. So I'm just saying, husbands, you can pray for your wives and vice versa. By using this method. Another method is uh, right here in verse 13 of the same text. You can pray for yourself. You didn't know that. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is there any sick? Let them call for the elders. You see, quite a distinction between verses 13 and 14. Are you afflicted with something? You're not bedfast, you see. You can be afflicted with polio. You can be afflicted with a deaf left ear. You can be afflicted with a cataract on your right eye. Afflictions. You're still working. You're functioning almost up to par. But a sick person in the Greek in verse 14 means one who's bedfast. He's helpless. He needs help. Let him call for the elders of the church. He needs help. You can get some sick friends 
uh, it's possible for, for most people to get so sick that they can't help themselves. That's why it says, let them call for the elders of church. But you can pray for yourself, verse 13. If it's a thing that doesn't require, as in verse 13, 14, uh, calling in others to help you pray and to help you get out of bed. Pray for yourself. This is Mark eleven twenty two to 24. He said, speak to that mountain. It'll be moved. What things soever you desire, when you pray, you believe you have received them and you shall have them. Pray for yourself. John 14, 14. If you ask, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Well, pray for yourself. Many, many times we are informed how people, as a result of hearing our tapes, reading our literature, are hearing a message, go home and pray for themselves. All kinds of miraculous healings. Lay hands on themselves. Claim their own healing. Like one sister who was bedfast with MS, multiple sclerosis, and somebody gave her a copy of our faith book. She said we had recently built a new swimming pool. Said I was getting worse and worse. I couldn't, uh, couldn't take care of my children. My husband was off in Vietnam. I had to call in help. I got progressively worse, and there was that nice pool. I couldn't swim. You don't dare go in the water by yourself with MS and all of that. Said I got a hold of the little faith book, read the chapter, believed it, claimed my healing, got up out of bed, started acting her faith. It didn't happen in five minutes. Started acting her faith, and in just a short time, a day or two, put on her swimsuit, went swimming by faith. Started ministering to her children by faith. Now, it was just a matter of weeks when we saw her. You'd never know she had had, had past tense MS. We had to believe that she, what she was saying was true because you couldn't tell it. She was totally healed. Now she prayed for herself. She claimed the promise, like we said in chapter 1 in her faith book. We tell you how to pray for yourself. That, in the final analysis, is the highest ideal anyway. And then there's Mark 16, the laying on of hands of any believer. Mark 16, verse 18 says... Jesus said, these signs will follow them that believe in my name. They shall lay hands on the sick. They'll recover. Mark 16, 18. Now, any believer can do this. Are you a believer? Well, that's the condition. There are only two conditions in Mark 16. You can pray for anybody as a believer. What are the conditions? He says you have to believe. These signs follow them that believe. Don't pray if you don't believe. Second condition, he says you have to use my name. It won't work because you prayed for them. He said, in my name, you can lay hands on the sick. And notice he doesn't even say you have to pray. It's all right if you want to. He says, in my name. How many of you believe that would work? Just lay hand on a sick person and say, in the name of Jesus. Why, sure it would work. Uh, I like to hear myself say, be healed. But he doesn't have to hear it because he knows why we're laying hands on the sick. And we use words not to supply God with information, but to help us know we've said what needs to be said. To release our faith, to tell God what we're believing, so we can hear it. He knows already. Those are the conditions. You can cast out demons. Anyone in here has the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't recommend it if you don't, although you could if you believed it, because you cast them out by faith, not by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps you to believe for it. But uh, any believer can do this. He can cast out spirits. Over in Mark 9, verses 38 to 40, remember Peter said, Master said to Jesus, we found a man casting out demons in your name. We forbade him because he isn't following us. He isn't part of our church. You ought to read that in, in Matthew 9. Mark 9, verses 38 to 40. And you know what Jesus said to him? Well, he couldn't have the message, could he? If he isn't following us, well, how do we know he's orthodox? <laughs> and after all, only apostles can cast out demons. No, he said, when Peter said, we forbade him because he followeth not us, Jesus said, forbid him not, for no man can do a miracle in my name and speak evil of me. Hallelujah. He said, leave him alone. Let him go ahead. All the demons he can get out, praise God. <laughs> so, <clears throat> he didn't say these signs follow the believers, I mean, uh, apostles. He said, believers, in my name, you can cast out demons. These signs will follow them to believe, just like in healing. A woman reported to me once who had been sitting under our teaching at least two years by the time this happened. And you keep teaching body ministry, encouraging it. Everywhere we go, we encourage it, even if we're there just a week. But I'd been teaching here for many, many months. And then she reported how that she got a phone call from a friend in Florida who was under terrific oppression. And she said, well, I know what it is. It's occult right away. 
she'd heard me say that's money time. Uh, she just said that first, and then oh yes, this, <clears throat> she asked her if she'd been involved in Ouija board fortune telling seances, and all she had. Well, she said, she said, Dennis, I'm caught, and God can deliver you and set you free of that. And then she's got to think. Well, I sure wish Brother Freeman was here. And what do you do next? And well, I'll have her call him. And then she said, No, wait a minute. I don't have to have her call him. I can take care of this myself. She said right over the phone. She said, I rebuke those spirits in Jesus' name. And she said, it was hardly out of her mouth until the woman began to retch and gag and said, I've got to leave. And took off. <laughs> now, she didn't know anything about demons coming out and went in and retched. And, of course, that's often the way spirits come out, just like in the Bible. And came back a changed individual, shouting the victory and joy of the Lord. She just decided that she was a believer and she could do it too, right over the telephone. A thousand miles away. Hallelujah. And then there is the consecrated or anointed cloth. That's Acts 19. I'm just giving you various ways besides the gifts that it'll, it'll work in your life, friends, as a charismatic believer. It would work even without the baptism. It just helps to have it. It just helps. For all the obvious reasons. For in Acts 19, 11, and 12, And God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul, <clears throat> so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs, or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. Now, if it's in the Bible, let's not fuss with it. Let's not say, as we Baptists used to, that's not for today. And when I heard of Right after I got saved, I'd, been, I'd, I'd grown up in a Baptist Sunday school, unsaved, you know, but I'd gotten indoctrinated. And when I heard that a certain church was sending out anointed cloths when they were requested, right away, I knew that was unscriptural, though I couldn't approve it. I just knew that wasn't right. It's too bad that when you don't know the Bible, you can prove anything you want. But there it says, there's an example. What we can do. And we have used this. We've used it time and time again. And time and time again we get replies back how it helps. I've told you about the woman who was totally possessed that her husband sent a handkerchief. And we, as a church, prayed over it. And God set her free. As soon as she touched that handkerchief, she was totally set free of all those spirits. She was ready for a mental institution. He was ready to divorce her or put her in a mental institution. It was that, that bad what he had to put up with. And an immediate deliverance and said that she's lost 10 years of aging in three days. That was his report. said, this is my first miracle. First miracle I've ever seen. Another brother, I was telling that in a meeting. He was a full gospel president. He reached in his pocket, gave me a handkerchief, said, have your church pray over that one. said, I've got some needs. And I thought, you know, like one need. And he asked me to come back and speak several months later. And I did. I said, well, uh, he had a son who was hearing voices. You know, I mean, uh, nobody was talking. <laughs> and I thought that's what he wanted for. And I said, well, how, how did it come out? Oh, I said, wonderfully. He said, I cut mine up in six pieces. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by that time, he said, two of them have already worked. Uh, he said, as soon as my son touched his piece, all voices stopped. He said, he's had no more problems. And uh, he mentioned something else. I don't know where all six went, but praise God. Um, you say, well, now, you mean there's healing in a piece of cloth? No, the Bible doesn't say there's healing in a piece of cloth. It says there's healing in faith. And when that person can't be here, then this acts as proxy, you see. And when they touch that, they release their faith, just like we're there laying hands on them as a church. I guess that's all right, because the Bible says it is. It says those who had diseases were healed. Now, it isn't going to work if they don't believe, and faith... Now, who was believing in the demon-possessed woman's case was the husband, which brings us to another way to, to see people healed, and that is by proxy. <clears throat> now, to be sure, most healing is not this way, but this is a valid way, as we see from Scripture. Take a person who's bedfast and can't get to your meeting. A loved one can come who has a concern and love for that one. Stand in proxy. That person in the bed can get out of bed. It happens. Not always that quickly, but I mean the healing comes. And it has to be a place where there's concern and faith, of course, in the proxy, because the proxy is just like a handkerchief, you see. 
They don't get healed. We lay hands on them and it's proxy, you see, for the other one. And does it work? Why, well, certainly it works. I had a man once say, you know, some people just can't buy the supernatural unless it's over TV on Bewitched or something like that. <laughs> That's a, our seance or some magician pulling his, doing his thing and deceiving. They'll even let him do that in the pulpit. But, you, but the, the real thing, everyone's afraid of it. And so he said, well, no, wait. He said, uh, you can tell he had that look of unbelief and skepticism on his face, which really ministered to me after preaching my heart out for an hour and a half on divine healing. He said, well, there's any biblical basis for this. Well, I said, brother, let's, let's, and I said it in a sweet way. I smiled at him. He was just telling me he didn't believe anything that he couldn't find in Scripture. I said, well, brother, let's, let's face it. First of all, God is doing it. It's happening, I said, all over the United States and Canada, everywhere we go. Miracles of healing. I said, if God's doing it, why argue with it? Now watch out. If you're going to say, well, you know, he isn't doing it, then the burden of proof's on you. Or if you're saying it's from another source, then you're in trouble if it's from the Lord. That's Matthew 13. Don't charge the works of God to the devil. You'd be better off say, I just don't believe it, than to do that. I mean... And if you want to fuss about something, fuss with your wife or husband or neighbor. It's not good to fuss, but don't fuss with God. And so I said, first of all, God's doing it. I said, now, if you need proof texts, there are plenty of them. But I said, it's like, you know, tongues. There's no word in Joel's prophecy they'll speak in tongues. And yet, that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. And when they asked, they said, when they heard the tongues of speaking in the various languages, they could understand them because they heard them praising God and telling his wonderful works. They said, what meaneth this? What mean these tongues? Peter said, this is that which Joel predicted. You go read Joel. He says they'll prophesy. Praise God they didn't need proof texts for tongues. It just happened. When they got the baptism, they began speaking in tongues. All through, all through the Bible, when you get the baptism, you start speaking in tongues. I'm all for proof texts. But if God's doing it, then just accept it. He started blessing me financially, you see. Not because I had a lot of proof text, but because I was desperate and believed it. <laughs> he said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all, all, he said, I'll supply all your needs. Praise God. Well, that's a pretty general statement. But he did just that. So I said, if you need proof text, the Bible is filled with them. I'll just give you one or two this morning. Like Matthew 8, the centurion came and said to Jesus, My servant is ill. Not even related to him, just a slave. He said, He's sick. He said, Would you come and pray for him that he'll be healed? Jesus, Jesus said, All right, let's go. Well, he said, No, wait a minute. He said, I'm, I'm in the army. I'm a centurion. He said, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. He said, If you'll just speak the word, my servant will be healed. Jesus said, I've never found such great faith in all of Israel. He said, be it unto you even as you believe it. All right. And we're told the servant was healed in the selfsame hour on the faith of the centurion. You like proof text? I just gave you one. How about Mark 7? The Syrophoenician woman. <clears throat> she stood in proxy for her daughter. said, my daughter hath a demon, grievously vexed with the devil. Will you deliver her? And you know the story. Jesus at first gave her qualified nose. And when she persisted, well, he said, great is your faith. He says, it's just like you say, and when she went back, her daughter had been delivered to the demon in the same hour. She stood in proxy for her daughter. This happens all the time. And you have it, <clears throat> so say, right in Scripture. I've had people call, stand in proxy on the phone, uh, or come in our meetings. One woman, I want to tell you, dear friends, that this is what gave she and her husband a ministry, because up to that point, she had been to our meetings two or three times, and she would sit near the front, but you could tell she didn't know what was going on. She didn't under have one inkling hardly of what I was talking about. That was the impression I had. <clears throat> but enough of the truth got through to her that she came and stood in proxy for her daughter, who had an incurable infection, <clears throat> had been taking so much penicillin that she could no longer take anymore. So what are they going to do? Nothing else helps. I said, do you really believe this? When I lay hands on your head, your daughter's healed of that infection. She said, I do. And I laid my hand on her head. I rebuked the infection in her daughter, claimed it in Jesus' name. She was believing it. She came back the next week, said, now here's what happened. She's had this incurable thing for months. Can't even take any more medicine. As soon as I got home, it's already manifested. It kind of convinced her there was something to this message. <laughs> and God really, as a result of that, they really went into the deep, deepness 
depth of faith than God has given them both a ministry. And uh, another brother <clears throat> came while we're still over in our other place and stood in proxy for his daughter. She's mentally ill. She didn't start out that way, but she's had a, a traumatic experience and she's mentally ill. She's in an institution now. I believe when you pray that God will set her free. Well, I said, brother, if you believe it, then it happens. We prayed for him, for his daughter in an institution. <clears throat> the next time I saw them, the daughter was with them. She was like 21, back to teaching school, as normal as you are. As soon as we prayed for her through him, the proxy, she was set free. Oh, it doesn't always happen, and the reason that it doesn't always happen because somebody is in meeting condition somewhere. You know, some people come and claim this and claim that, and they're not really believing, and uh, there may be other things that God wants to work in a person. We can't go into all that this morning, <clears throat> but we're saying it does work when the conditions are met. And it works so often that, that uh, we know that it always works when the conditions are met. And then, of course, there is the gift of healing. Are the gifts of healings? Not everyone have, will have these. But all of these other methods will work. If you have the gifts of healing, I'll tell you, <clears throat> you'll, you'll know it because it'll begin to happen in your ministry. And of course, I'm talking to the body. The body has a ministry that people you pray for, you discover, <clears throat> suddenly get instantaneous or immediate healings of certain things. And as you... Over the weeks and months and years, you notice certain things get healed every time you lay hands on them, and they've been prayed for by others. <clears throat> this is kind of how I discovered it. The Lord has given me gifts of healings because there are certain things that operate almost instantly as we pray for them. Some of those were called for this morning. <clears throat> and the anointing is in the hands or the hand, and of course God has confirmed this uh, uh, Years ago, he began to heal certain things. You'd see, you'd, of course, everything gets healed that you prayed for by faith. But you see, it may not be a gift of healing operating, therefore it isn't an instant manifestation like minutes, hours, days. Uh, that sort of thing. <clears throat> but when you have gifts, you may have six things God will heal through you. But he may have three or four in the body that he's using. Uh, that the other gifts will operate through them. So that one person won't be indispensable. And so <clears throat> certain things began to be healed. And then I noticed that, that, a, that a curious anointing like 110 volts of electricity would be in my left hand uh, when I was anointed to pray for the sick. And I'm feeling it right now. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. I've never ever felt anything in my right hand unless I touch something. That's just the way it operates. Then he has confirmed it, as I say, in ways that we won't go into this morning, but uh, has even shown in the spirit. Uh, but the, the gift operates, we have seen it where you believe, and it was called out this morning. We have seen innumerable, countless cases of sinus healed immediately. <clears throat> so our brother said the Lord showed two cases of sinus here. Well, that'll go right away. Blood conditions. Now, blood conditions can cover a lot of things from varicose veins to, <clears throat> um, well, leukemia. Blood conditions. Pain. Infections of all kinds. These are just things that go <clears throat> right away. Testimony after testimony of where they were ready for surgery or incurable and that sort of thing go right away. MS, generally. When I say generally, this is just something that, uh, that uh, has a lot of dependence on what the person's believing. MS is like cancer. You know, a, per a person can be get so bound with an affliction that they come for prayer, but they're not really believing anything. So gifts never work. You see, I don't need the gifts. They're for the person who believes. And they never work. You can take a gift and it'll just be like uh, taking a loaf of bread home and putting it in the bread box and leaving it there. If you don't believe it, if you don't take it out and eat it, you see it'll do you no good. So if you don't believe it. Now we can mention other things, but there's no point going through a catalog of what we see healed instantly. And when we say instantly, so we mean that it will follow the prayer if you believe it. Father, we thank you that you've not left your body 
to grow old and sick and die prematurely in pain and by sickness and disease. <clears throat> but you've placed the remedy in the church based upon the atonement of Jesus Christ. That there is healing in your wings. Hallelujah. He was wounded for my transgressions. I 